Hearing audiences for people who are deaf, hard of hearing, and also people who have physical disabilities, uh, and also seeing where perhaps their specific requirements might be met together. Uh, we have five speakers today um, from France, from the UK, and also from the United States. And I'd like to invite Larry Goldberg, uh, director of um, National. Uh, ah, uh, it's about the National Center for Accessible Media, uh, who has long-standing experience and who is a bit, who is a father figure for closed captioning in the United States and in historical terms, it also means for Europe and the rest of the world. I heard of him already in the 80s whilst I worked at the Royal National Institute of Blind People in the UK. So welcome, Larry. Uh, <laughs> though I did a two or three years ago get a lifetime achievement award which meant I should retire like right away <laughs> uh, haven't yet though um, we have some great uh, opportunities to talk about some interesting technologies and approaches to uh, helping make museums accessible for people who are deaf or hard of hearing or have physical disabilities uh, my organization the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH in Boston was founded uh, as an institution to help make media accessible, accessible to people who are deaf or blind. Uh, so we're very media focused, uh, technology, um, information technology. So much of what uh, I can show you today is really about uh, media, mostly dynamic media, but it also could be static uh, media as well. Um, I mentioned in my last presentation that anyone who has a smartphone or an iPad or anyone who's on the web right now, take out your devices, don't put them away because I'm going to invite you to try, try something out and it's going to be a big test. So I don't know how it's going to work, uh, but it should be good. So we talked about um, calling this presentation uh, Innovations in Technology, Turning Sound into Words because that's what people who have hearing impairments or are deaf need, turning sound into words. Though of course Simon will talk about other ways of making um, imagery and content accessible. We happen to focus on text and words uh, and <coughs> captioning, where, which was actually invented in the United States at WGBH in the uh, early 70s. Uh, eventually that became closed captioning where users could actually turn on and off captions at their own choice. I, I say here that captioning is now pervasive or can be. That is that the technologies are all very well tested for putting captions on any platform mobile devices, the web, TV, DVDs, online, on the movies, uh, it's all pretty well developed. So we don't really have to worry about inventing things in order to make uh, captioning more widely available. Now that doesn't mean that everyone's actually using it. Uh, there's still quite a bit of either advocacy or awareness we need to do and that's why we're here this week. Um, but we've actually seen some wonderful advancements both in the technology as well as in the requirements and standards for bringing captioning everywhere. Um, absolutely online. Uh, only a few years ago I would talk about how we could bring captions to online media. Now it's well, well done, like a good um, hamburger. And it is um, also with a number of standards and now requirements. I have two screen images here, one from Hulu, a pretty well-known uh, site full of videos and there are captions on many many of the videos on Hulu. On this image uh, we're seeing the TV show Glee um, and the on-screen menu that shows closed caption choices in English on or off, different caption styles. You can actually shape the captions to look how you'd like them to look and you can search in Hulu for videos that have captions. So if you only want to see videos that have captions you can check a box and do that. And right next to that image is a, scene, uh, a screenshot from iTunes, which has the same capability, searching movies and TV shows for those that are captioned. And uh, then display captions on whatever iDevice you happen to use. So iPad, iPod, iTunes, uh, QuickTime, uh, captions are available on both of those platforms. PBS actually started putting captions on its TV shows online more than a decade ago. Really the very first version of QuickTime had 
caption capability, QuickTime 1.0, and we began doing that right immediately. Uh, the TV show Nova was the first. Here's a screenshot from the American Experience TV show, which uh, supports captions in its Flash player. And you'll see in the upper right, there's a little CC logo. And uh, it's a little hard to see, as well as the rating of the TV show. And uh, you're probably aware that YouTube is also supporting captions. Uh, uploaded captions, if you have the caption file in multiple languages, if you have multiple languages. Uh, they even provide an automated uh, transcription service, uh, though the accuracy of that is somewhat marginal so far. Uh, it might get better, but for now, um, what's great about YouTube is you can upload your own caption file and display those. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the new internet captioning rules in a bit. Um, I mentioned earlier today that m theaters and museums uh, can also have captions uh, through a variety of means, but one of the earliest and now been around for more than 10 years. Um, and very happy to say that the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian was the first to install a rear window captioning system at the Langley Air and Space Museum. Uh, it operates through the use of a large data wall, a big LED sign in the rear of the theater. The words on that data wall are reversed and you get a reflector that you put at your seat. Uh, this image shows that it's fitting into a cup holder, though the uh, Air and Space Museum does not allow drinks. So they actually provide their reflectors by a uh, little plug-in right into the seat. Uh, Disney World is uh, another place that has uh, more than 40 uh, installations of what they call reflective captioning, but it is rear window. And they have a mic stand that you just bring into the Disney attraction, and you can adjust your reflector and read the captions behind you. Uh, here in Atlanta, the Coca-Cola Museum has an installation. IMAX theaters now all over the United States, national parks, visitor centers, as well as conventional theaters. Just regular old theaters have been installing this as well. Um, on the mobile world, uh, Apple began supporting captions on the iPhone three generations ago now. So if you have a movie that's been captioned, you can actually w turn on and off captions, and it's right in the settings on your iPhone um, under the accessibility settings or under the <coughs> video settings. There's actually quite a bit of accessibility settings on all the iDevices. If you haven't played with it, go into your settings accessibility menu. It's quite amazing how Apple has taken what was probably the most inaccessible technology and turned it into one of the most accessible technologies. Um, I remember how angry people in the blind community got when the first iPhone came out, and now a few years later, um, almost every blind person I know has an iPhone. So it's really quite amazing. BlackBerry played a little bit of catch up, but now they have actually a wonderful captioning utility as well. And they even did it a little better. They allow you to choose size, font, and placement when you're watching videos on a BlackBerry or a device, a BlackBerry that has captions built in. Uh, so I'm going to do a demonstration now of a, a new technology, very new, just rolled out in September called Media Access Mobile, first installed at the IBM Centennial Exhibition in New York City at Lincoln Center. Uh, the exhibition was called Think, and they had a multimedia exhibit which uh, was stored up on digital servers and they provided iPod Touches uh, to any visitor who asked. And when you got your iPod Touch, you can turn on captioning in any of uh, eight languages, including English, if you were an English speaker, um, or translations in, in various other languages. Um, and then, just after the exhibit closed just a few weeks ago, we added video description as well, so that as you walk through an environment, you can actually hear description provided to you. Um, here's how it looks on an uh, iPhone or any kind of Wi-Fi enabled device. The three languages which you see here are English, uh, Italian, and Chinese, or Japanese. I can't quite read that, but we had both. Um, and now I'm going to take the rest of my time. We're going to give it a try. Um, if you have a web enabled device right now, here um, there's very good Wi-Fi access. Uh, I think it says MCN 2011 as your hotspot. Try entering this um, address. I'll leave it up there for just a second, and then I'm going to turn it on on the computer as well. And what we're doing here is displaying a video, which is the kind of video that might be playing in a gallery or anywhere within your facility. And synchronized to that is 
a series of caption and description files. So they're playing completely independently, but in sync. Everyone ready? Type that in. All right, I'll wait, I'll wait. And we uh, are stress testing the system now. If you know that term, it means we could crash it. A group of 40? Excuse me? A, group, a use of a group, by a group of 40 that crashes? Um, we don't know. We've never tried it before. It shouldn't, but uh, this is the first rollout. I'm just going to take a look at the website. What you should see is nothing but this when you get to that site. Just a little tiny link. Don't click it yet. I know you probably, yeah, I know, you've already clicked it. All right, so anyone else need to see that um, URL again? Here it is. You should see that little tiny link. I'm going to get the media playing. Whoops. This is the media. It's an open source animation called Sintel. It's a wonderful piece of media that uh, was contributed to by animators all over the world, and it's used for, it's open source. Anyone can use it for testing. So we use it for testing. Um, it's an animated story about a little girl and a dragon. And we've provided captions in English and Russian, descriptions in audio form, and descriptions in text form. And you'll sw you can switch among all of them. Of course, the captions will only appear when someone's speaking. So if you don't see any captions, that's because no one's talking. Let's give it a shot. <laughs> I'm going to bring up. I'm going to bring up closed captions. Shrink it down. Oh yeah, well someone has to talk first. first. And maybe while we're waiting for someone to talk, we'll try. Rewinding. Give it a moment. Inside the yurt, a shaman studies the this spear. Blade has your description. It has shed much innocent blood. He ladles hot soup into a bowl. You're a fool for traveling alone so completely the unprepared. Video's playing a little slowly now. I think we're. You're lucky. Your blood's right still flowing. He hands her the bowl. Thank you. You're hearing the audio from the original so, movie, and then it's time. What brings to you to the land of the gatekeepers? I'm searching for someone. Someone very dear. Let's see some captions while we're doing it. A dragon. Anyone getting captions yet? I haven't pushed that button. A dangerous quest for a lone hunter. I've been alone for as long as I can remember. No, do not load the media. You shouldn't see the media. If you load the media, then you'll definitely crash the system. But I didn't give you that URL anyway. Try to reload it. Let's try some Russian. That's good for my sister, you know. <laughs> when you And you heard the descriptions come up. So basically, all of these, what we call the access files, are resident on a server, and they're all playing uh, independently. Uh, that means Sintel well, cautiously holds out her hand and the dragon sniffs dialogue. her fingers. Later, in her hovel, Sintel cleans the wound. Hey, shh, shh. We're almost done. Hey, sit still. With a, a smile, Sintel cradles the little creature. Little Later, she dialogue. sets down a bowl of water and smooths a garment way, into we'll a cozy nest. Tomorrow, the dragon crawls the into the nest and lies down. In her bed, Sintel pulls a cover up to her chin. Scales. Time passes. The little dragon, Scales, sleeps near Sintel's bed. Now Scales sleeps curled up next to Sintel, its head nestled into the crook of the girl's tattooed shoulder. Sintel's fingers curve gently around the dragon's tiny talons. A scar from the wound forms a jagged pattern on its left wing. A chicken runs down an alleyway. Get him, Scales! The dragon chases the chicken. The dragon chases the chicken. It flies over a cart. 
Sintel follows, running past startled city dwellers. She barrels into a crate of fruit, spilling it. Sintel stops and looks around. The chicken falls at Sintel. I'm switching over to English captions now. I'm switching over. <laughs> Uh, this is available on YouTube, uh, Sintel, it's a great little story. And we're going to add some more captions to the program because uh, mostly it's... is speaking right now. Except for sound. Well, I'm not seeing it myself. Helen, you grabbed the only caption uh, service available. You show it to everyone or leave your computer. Show it to the audience. Pause the moment. Explain a little bit about the so I just paused the, the, the media so you won't see anything at the moment. So what's happening there is that uh, the notion is that wherever in your environment you might have some media playing, whether it's off a digital server or a DVD, it would then trigger a server where all the other files are resident and would send them out at the same time. And then you give your uh, customers or your visitors a, a URL and they can select any of these off the list. We're running it off of an experimental server right up in Boston right now. Um, what I didn't dare to do is bring what we call our suitcase. Actually, we call it the suitcase bomb, but I did not want to bring it on the airplane and call it that. <laughs> the whole system is, is uh, on a little netbook with a uh, hotspot, a Wi-Fi hotspot, and I could set it up right here and generate a little Wi-Fi node right here, which would be a little bit more robust than trying to hit the server back in Boston. So. What it does is synchronize media from two completely different sources, whether they, it has time code in it or whether it's embedded in the media or wherever it may be. So the notion is mobile devices now can be proliferated. You can have people bring their own if they're more comfortable with their own device, uh, or you can hand them out. Um, what's nice about the iPod Touches, as um, Nancy mentioned, is you can actually turn voiceover on on your iPod device and a blind person can use it or bring their own uh, however they set it up. So that's the nature of how it works. Um, afterwards, uh, when we maybe have less load on the internet, um, I can show you right on my own uh, computer or on um, online on, on my own iPhone how the captions can work in sync. So gave it a little bit of extra stress today, but I'm glad at least, Helen, did anyone else actually see the captions? Anyone else wise? Okay, so it was working, just not on this laptop here. Um, and um, I can show you another example uh, later. But I think that's all I will show you for now. Um, and only one more thing, and that's the contact information. Um, and if you want to go ahead and ask questions. Do you also caption the audio descriptors, or do you only caption? Can I just uh, ask yeah. if speaking to Mike via recording? Sure. Um, do yeah. you caption the audio descriptors, or just the original audio? Well, interestingly, in this test system, we actually transcribed all the descriptions too in text. So you can switch to that because there were four choices on that menu. English, Russian, DVS, meaning descriptive video audio, and DVS text. So you could actually have that text available to you as well to feed to a screen reader, to a braille reader, whatever. It tends to be kind of confusing to someone, particularly if they have residual hearing, to see the captions, hear the descriptions, see the captions, it's a bit of an overload. But yes, we could. That would be your choice in your own institution. Could be a little bit much. And all of this can be online on your own museum website too, which is a pretty important opportunity. Someone could see it in advance, then come to the museum, already have that experience and ready to go. Is there one more question, comment? I just wanted to be 
clear, make sure I understood this, but the captioning and the, and the video or audio description are in separate files. They're not encoded with the video. No. And is the open source tool Sintel, or was that the name of the animation? Yeah, oddly enough, the girl's name is Sintel, and it sounds like the name of a technology, like Intel. That's always confused me. The open source media, the content, is it, that's what's open source. Uh, okay. The, the the video that we use for testing purposes. So what is the tool set the that... The software that we have is called Media Access Mobile. Okay. That's not open source, um, but it's been purchased by a number of institutions, and it's a fairly small, robust system. Much better than you see right here today. Thanks. So the only open source thing is the movie about a girl named Sintel. Confusing. Well, do you have to do anything special with your video ahead of time? You said time code or could you put um, any QuickTime film and? Yeah, yeah. It could just run in conjunction with on the server and it'll just use uh, web events or uh, time code markers if okay. it doesn't have embedded time code. So no, it's just a, a piece of video, any kind of video. It's great if you've got SMPTE time code on it. That makes it so much more facile and reliable. But we know a lot of media that museums use don't have time code. Okay, so thanks. So just run at the same time. And well, one, last, Marcus. one last question, <laughs> Susan. Thank you. Larry, what are the applications? How are you seeing this being used in a museum other than, well, how are you seeing it being used? Well, we first of all see it wherever there's a film festival or a lot of media in a museum, <laughs> theater, uh, video art. Secondly, uh, in environments like you could walk into a room where there are paintings or sculptures and have the descriptions triggered on your Wi-Fi network. Now, the real challenge right now is that to trigger that, you're either going to use an IR system, like is common for um, a lot of audio tours, um, or like the Museum of Fine Arts right now is doing something like this, but you have to punch in the number of the uh, piece. Well, how does a blind person know what number to punch? The device is accessible, but how do you know what you're looking at at the moment? That's the next challenge. Right now, what is commonly available is in either IR or a Bluetooth trigger that tells you, I am here, I'm looking at this object, and then play out the description. And even an audio scanner, one of those QR, QR codes? still need to know where it was on exactly. the Exactly. A QR code is so promising, but for that last step, which is, I'm blind, where am I going to point my device? Um, if there's some guide towards that, that could work too. So there's also ways of adapting, in essence, an iTunes player. Uh, you can load all this up into your own iTunes player, as we did with the Whitney. And instead of uh, albums, we actually called each floor a different floor number. And instead of songs, we had objects. So you walk into the gallery, and you just choose what song you want, but it's actually a description of an object. Uh, no, it's an accessible user interface. Audio requests would be great too, we haven't built that yet. Uh, with Siri now, as I said earlier, like the Tenement Museum, that's easily next. We haven't developed it yet. So we could... Uh, Sorry, I'm taking no, too much No, 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 it's, it's fantastic, it's, it's fascinating. Time, <laughs> it opens so many opportunities and as you know, captioning opens opportunities for very large numbers of people including some deaf people, but not all deaf people. And in this session, we will be looking at how technology can also enable born deaf people who either rely on sign language or wish to use sign language as their language of cultural identity to have access to museum collections. We have three speakers who will uh, talk about projects here, and I would like to invite Emmanuel from Schack, von Schack from the Metropolitan Museum to tell us also about deaf experience and some of his reflections on accessibility. Meanwhile, Larry is, I think, setting up his PowerPoint. <laughs> no, no, oh, for Emmanuel? Okay. Yeah. Sure. I will be right here. <laughs> Thank you for your help. Uh, yes, if I be ready to help me because I may need you. I want to thank you for uh, this opportunity and for uh, it, your introduction, and it's so good to hear all of the presentations we've heard so far, uh, of how to make museums accessible to deaf people. Um, I'm going to fast forward through this because I did cover this in my introduction. Oh, that was too fast, one moment. 
Okay, now, picking up from where I left off earlier, there are four different kinds of services that we can provide to deaf people to give them access to communication. Transcribed audio guides, sign language interpreting, uh, interpreted tours, deaf museum educators, and technology enabling access to resources with captions and sign language. We're going to talk about the pros and cons of transcribed audio, and then we'll look at the other three points as well. Some of the benefits, and this is a really good one, is to, uh, they actually enhance the museum experience. When you go to a museum, you can see the artwork, you can uh, see the information uh, described auditorily, and uh, there's lots of information that's involved in that if you could also read the scripted guide. So that's a good experience. But the problem for deaf individuals is the span, uh, attention span. This is the 21st uh, century, and deaf people are a part of it. Do you think they're going to sit there and read two or three pages of a scripted audio guide? I think that would be really uh, wearing on the person to read, and, and then when do you look up and... And uh, so it's really has become problematic. And we're seeing that more and more uh, uh, today that uh, people have a shorter attention span. And also, if you're thinking about the, the booklet of the completed audio guide, it can be 200 pages long. And that's not a little, uh, t uh, little uh, book. It's, it's not like wake. And so people uh, standing and walking through the museum on their feet, in addition to carrying this huge uh, book, it can become physically tiring, especially can you imagine an older person who has perhaps some manual dexterity problems? The weight of that book would be uh, problematic. The language pr proficiency of deaf visitors is also problematic. It's uh, kind of uh, short. As Simone had mentioned earlier, uh, he was talking about uh, the uh, liter literacy rate of deaf individuals we, in France, and we have the same issue here in America. Uh, the educational system is problematic in teaching uh, deaf individuals, and uh, it's a second language issue of reading. So that is a problem in the US and France and all over more than likely in other countries in the world. So uh, unfortunately, but that does uh, affect the people who come to our museums. They're not really able to access the audio guide in written English because it's not their first language and they struggle with uh, being able to understand uh, English vocabulary. Now let's look at the pros and cons of sign language interpreted tours. The information can be uh, given in sign language uh, instead of a script. And so that is, um, it's, it's accessible in sign language. Most often deaf people's first language is sign language. And so that means that they can access the guided tour information in their primary language, which is very nice. And uh, the interactive learning experience of deaf and hard of hearing visitors is, is a great benefit. And so, and so they go to a tour and they really want to interact with uh, others who are hard of hearing or hearing and uh, ask questions and get their answers and chat and chat with others who are in the uh, group who is being guided through the museum. And it's like Simone mentioned earlier, the deaf cultural experience and, I'm sorry, what's your name? Susan, that's right, thank you. Uh, so Susan was mentioning that uh, at the Smithsonian Institute, the, there are guided tours in sign language, and that has to uh, give a great sense of ease to the deaf visitors who come. But it also enables them to interact with the hearing uh, individuals. And to see the two cultures come together, you can learn from one another, not only from hearing, but also from deaf culture. And that gives a great socialization mix, which is a, uh, a nice learning experience. 
problems with this, though, is the infrequency of interpreted tours. I use the word frequency, or lack thereof, of interpreted tours and the availability of deaf visitors. Many museums have exhibits that are provide and also provide uh, events, special events like once a month or every two weeks or a specific day and time uh, of the month, but that may conf conflict with uh, individuals who are deaf being able to come because of work. Uh, so they really don't have that random access to the guided tours. If an out-of-town visitor comes in for the weekend and they come to New York and they want to go to the Met and, uh, shoo, they're not offering a tour that, that weekend. So, again, that is not a random access. Um, that is something we heard about earlier today. And um, that is uh, just, you know, just like everyone else, being able to come when you want to, whatever time you want to, and not have a specific time or day. Uh, I see a problem with that because, you know, how even though it's good to set up a time and day, but it's not random access. And the accommodation issues as a result of ignorance or inconsideration. That happens when, especially in, in interpreted tours, when you have deaf and, and hearing people come together, that the two cultures being different it's they've got to share the same area and space, which can be nice. It can be really nice, especially if you don't have captions. But what happens is what we've seen is a cultural clash between the two cultures of hearing and deaf. It's, it is a problem we've seen. It's deaf people have to be in front in order to see the interpreter. So uh, oftentimes, uh, out of ignorance or in consideration, a hearing person will come up and stand in front of the interpreter. And sometimes you can just say, oh, excuse me, I can't see. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> so if a hearing presenter is there, sometimes they're not aware uh, that they cannot manage the crowd well. Uh, you will see this happening. They're, they're busy with their own thoughts and it just becomes uh, quite uncomfortable. The nature of the interpreting process is uh, intriguing as well, and it can be a, a, it can be a problem uh, when you go between two spoken languages or uh, sign language and a spoken language. There is a time lag and getting through the interpretation process. Sometimes uh, if you have a, an excited speaker or, and uh, you see two hearing people talking back and forth and they talk all over uh, each other and then by the time the interpreter gets the information there, it's too late, they've moved on to the next topic. And so the, just the nature of the interpreting process in an interpreted tour is, is hard to moderate sometimes. And, and the, so the docent or whoever has to be very, uh, uh, very uh, hands-on in managing the crowd, handling uh, questions and answers, et cetera. Now, let's look at deaf museum educators and some of the benefits and problems that can come with that. Uh, you have direct language communication and shared cultural space with an educator who speaks the same language you do. And it's like Susan was talking about, if you have deaf educators come to the Smithsonian, oh, what an awesome experience to have uh, the knowledge presented to you in your language. And you can also uh, make the cultural adjustments as, as necessary, So because you're, you're part of the culture. And it's just such a comfort to be able to access that in a language from a deaf person who shares the same language and cu cultural norms and values. Uh, one of the great advantages of this is you have less chance of accommodation issues happening because it's not an interpretive process. When you have a deaf educator and you have hearing uh, people who are there with children, sometimes uh, what happens is that deaf people will see me given presentation and uh, then, uh, you know, the, interpreting, uh, they, the interpreter who will be uh, speaking into English what I sign uh, helps me to be able to manage the crowd control. And so, and that, that is, um, that's less chance of an accommodation issue happening when you have that information. Information access is in sign language. And that's, um, 
It's also it's given from a cultural perspective, whether it's in uh, American Sign Language or French Sign Language or whatever. So that's great. And one of the unique uh, advantages of this uh, for deaf and hearing attendees is that they get to see a deaf professional. And that is, uh, that is just really neat to see. Uh, oftentimes, uh, hearing people perceive us as disabled and uh, inferior. So it's nice to be able to see deaf individuals on the same level as the professionals that they see in otherwise not oppressed and not put aside, not, uh, you know, just looked down on. So it's nice to see <clears throat> the role model of a deaf professional being able to get up there and do what hearing In the bigger museums, a hearing docent uh, is just really, many of them don't know, uh, don't know them, but uh, with my badge, I am being, a, I'm able, I, you know, I'll let people know that I lead guides, uh, uh, I lead tours, and I work at the museum. Sometimes we do get interpreters in there. And every time I present, I see the same thing happening. I see some hearing individuals who are frequent visitors here. They're regulars of mine in my tour. And, and it's not because I'm deaf, but because they like my presentation style. They like what I have to say when I do present. And so we have this interaction, uh, and we've gotten familiar with each other. And so it's really nice to have hearing people come and be part of my uh, group. And it's always good to see, because they just like me. They, they know I'm Emmanuel and that I'm deaf, but it's nice to be able to be visible and, and have and see the societal attitude change because I'm just there. So it's really nice. I, I just like to see, I just like to be one of those uh, deaf professionals up there. However, ASL only led tours it can be uh, viewed as reverse di discrimination by deaf people. But what we tend to do is like uh, if a deaf person wants to go on a tour, if they let us know in advance, we can, in our access office, then we can give, uh, you know, like I'm going to be there in a couple of weeks, we can set up an interpreter. And so hearing people can do the same thing. Uh, so if it's an ASL only tour, then we can provide interpreters and they can hear in English what I'm signing. So, I mean, it works and they just have to know to ask for that accommodation for, uh, for themselves. Um, I forgot, you know, I, this issue do, does come up, but I just want to make you aware of that. And again, it's the random access issue of sign language tours. How often do we present? I mean, it's just maybe once a month at the Met. Um, the Guggenheim Museum, we uh, give a tour there once a month in ASL. If we have other deaf presenters, they could give uh, the tours more often. Uh, and um, the Met does have hourly uh, guided tours. We do have that on a daily basis. So. Uh, this is not exactly random access when you only have them once a month. Now, last but not least, the technology resources for deaf visitors. The benefits, of, co of course, are direct language access to the information and resources that are provided. And uh, captioning, uh, it can uh, benefit hearing people as well who um, perhaps don't understand the English language as much. It can give access, it, it is accessible to deaf visitors anywhere and anytime. Doesn't matter whether they live out in a farmland uh, or out west, uh, they can get the museum experience with interpreted resources, etc. cetera. Uh, and so it's better than nothing but it's nice to have access to that, to be able to look, it up, look at it online and see someone in, in sign language and be able to perhaps uh, uh, you know, even visit a French museum from sitting in your living room. Uh, in DC, you can look at a presentation in sign language uh, from the Smithsonian. So, uh, I mean, it's just really so nice. It's a nice access to the world of museum. However, 
Accommodating the different needs among the deaf population is uh, challenging. There are a variety of philosophies of how we de educate deaf individuals. Some people are ad are ad language for everyone. So there, it's just it, it, the mode and the modality and the language is all different. So accommodating the different needs among the deaf population is extremely challenging. Uh, it, you know, sometimes you can sign in uh, American Sign Language, but the deaf person uses English Sign Language. It's, it's just very, very challenging. And the lack of lexicon in sign language. Now, this is unique. Because of the new laws that have been passed uh, for the re mandated requirement to provide communication access, this has really opened up the world for deaf people. Uh, to be a, on an uh, equal playing field with hearing people. For a long time, deaf people have been oppressed and limited in their ability to live uh, just like anyone else and have access to the information. Uh, and this also applies to other language groups as, as well. But for the American Sign Language group, it's less, uh, American Sign Language itself is less than 200 years old. Before they passed this, these Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, to, uh, to encourage accommodation, would people have access to a museum, to higher education? It's quite, it was quite limited because of the access to being able to understand the language. Now, after the passage of law, we see more people catching up with just a daily uh, living experience. For example, I major in art history. Is the problem is I have seen that we don't have enough art lexicon for in the American Sign Language. Uh, it's like we have terminology that is uh, just uh, specialized to art history, but we've just got a lexicon terminology uh, in American Sign Language and not in just in English. <laughs> I'll try to hurry up. <laughs> so sorry. Um, for example, we have different technology resources for deaf individuals, just a gamut of them, like for visual guides. Remember, I was talking about how some of you have the, uh, audi uh, you know, the audible uh, tour guide. It's like you can use an iPhone, an iPad, an iPod, or whatever. That's a, that's a resource that we can use. And so you can see the sign language. We could work that out. I think there is a way to make that happen. There's one museum in Spain, in Madrid, that has, um, it, it, you see the name up here that the interpreter cannot say. And so, um, so that museum <laughs> is, uh, I'm going to show you just a really quick demo of what this looks like. They've, are, they've got to set up with the sign language. And I'm going to need your help, please. It's a great master. <laughs> I can translate this uh, for the. Inter I can speak this into uh, English um, because I do. I do know sign. Uh, do know Spanish. So, if you need a an interpreter, just let me know. <laughs> and you can see the vocabulary of surrealism. If we could click on that, it would give the definition of the word, and that would be really nice. Of all the blue words, are going to be linked to a definition. Yeah, I'm trying to find a specific uh, point in a clip, but I know my time is limited, so I don't think I'm going to try to do that anymore. That's okay. Um, just moving forward, um, the benefit for deaf people can be uh, like they could ben uh, have uh, an equal basis. It's like, I think Simone's going to be talking about that later, so I'm not going to go into it. But the European Parliament in Brussels, Belgium, that is really neat because what they've done, they are working on developing uh, video 
uh, that is in a mobile device. And uh, a person will take a mobile device on a tour. And they have chosen four languages from the, Euro uh, from the EU there. And it's really nice. But the sign language, I mean, uh, they have in all the different languages, spoken language, but they've only chosen four for sign language. British, Dutch, German, and French sign language. That is the only four sign languages they provide this in. And the reason being is that those four governments are the ones who are funding this project. So that's, again, problematic that all of Europe should be able to access their museums through their language. But they have limited it to only four of all the languages that are available there. So the deaf people from Italy or Spain are not going to be able to have access. <laughs> so uh, that is, that's challenging. But the wonderful thing is that they're working on it. And they're working and they're progressing on it. And I think it's gonna, uh, just going to be really, really good. They're going to have to really work to get it uh, up to speed. But it's going to be a good thing. The museum website is another technological resource. Who pre are you going to be presenting about this, Susan? Okay, great. Okay, um, then I'll let you uh, take care of that part. Now, at the Whitney, um, first let me mention briefly about the Smithsonian Institute. They have um, galleries, talks, and so uh, they will have a deaf uh, educator there and with, uh, talking about the art, et cetera. The Whitney does the same thing, but more v uh, through a vlog, a video log. And so that means that they will talk about, individuals talk about their experiences. Let me show you that. This is fascinating. Um, and we can, uh, we can just look at how, how they pr perceived everything that they were looking at. <coughs> Let me see. I, I don't want to waste my time trying to find this, but I don't know. I think I'm past my time. Uh, I so apologize. But... Um, the Art Lexicon website, is, the problem is the same thing. It's, special, we have, it's a specialized field. We have got to develop a lexicon and disseminate it to deaf individuals throughout the country. Art ASL in New York City is a project that I am the director of. And I have a good friend of mine uh, who is working with me, and we have started at the Met Museum because we really wanted to establish some kind of lexicon in the field of art. And we've talked about this for years and we didn't do anything about it. We've given presentations, we've, you know, we've had students who take art classes and, and, and we have an interpreted, uh, interpreter there that just keeps fingerspelling the art of words, you know? I mean, it's just, and so I mean, we're trying to become uh, facilitators of the communication and so we're trying to come up with a lexicon for these uh, for this terminology that we use so so easily. New Yorkers love art, and I have a friend of mine who uh, who has moved to New York who loves it. And we talked about setting up a formal uh, website platform to develop this lexicon. It's in the very early stages, but I do want to show it to you. So far, we have only uh, developed a, a list of about 80 terms that, and we got together with, what we did was got together with a bunch of deaf folks who said, okay, how can we in sign language sign this conceptually accurate? And to then disseminate this to other deaf individuals, uh, pro uh, professionals, et cetera, in the field. And uh, we also want to share it with the interpreters. Let me show you one example.
and we're going to be playing with that a little bit. But for right now, and it's going to be at artasl.com. That's the website, and you can check it out. But, you know, it's in the early stages. Let's see what else I need to cover here. Is it? Okay, let me see if I can do this. <laughs> okay, in conclusion. <laughs> Collaboration among different institutions and organizations from local to international levels. We have in other countries, folks are doing generally the same thing that we're doing. And we want to collaborate with them, like Simone is working on something. And then, you know, we have the similar goals. So why cannot we, why can we not come together in a synergistic effort and pool our resources and our, the funding and, uh, and just get the people together to do, uh, to accomplish our common goals. And then we have the political and cultural activism, um, like uh, the uh, UN, uh, the UN convention, that uh, somebody need, you know took on that, and we need to uh, we need to help them uh, do the same thing. The outreach and working with the deaf population. Uh, what are their needs? What are their desires? What will benefit them the most? How can we work with them? Because you know, it's you know, we've got to. Uh, if we come up with something that is of no use to them, then why waste our effort on that? But it is a work in progress, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it as the days go on this week. And I want to thank you for your attention. And your